Hello and welcome to the Commander's Quarters, your Magic the Gathering source that helps you command your budget. This show and episodes like this one are possible thanks to viewers like you. If you're looking for an easy way to help support this show, make sure that you like, share, and subscribe. Also, hit that bell notification icon so you don't miss any new episodes. You can also go check out our playmats and other merchandise at thecommandersquarters.com. Another easy way to support this show is with our TCG Player affiliate links. So whether you're buying a deck or individual cards, you can use this general link right here or one in the description. And the final way that you can support this show is by supporting us directly by becoming a patron. There are many benefits to being a patron, and I truly couldn't do this without all their support. Hey everyone, Mitch coming in from the Commander's Quarters studio. Welcome to the show. So, on today's episode, I'm going to take you through the most powerful decks in my collection. I'm going to talk about the Commander, I'm going to talk about how I built the deck, and what makes it so powerful. So yeah, with all that said, let's jump into it. So, for those of you that watched the episode where I talked about the one deck that I don't play anymore, this one probably won't come as a surprise. Jory Will Weather Like Captain is my most powerful deck. Now, I guess the title of that episode should be the one deck I won't play anymore, except in very, 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 very rare occasions. Because Joyra is absurdly powerful even on the smallest of budgets. I built my Joyra deck for $25. And in my opinion, it is definitely my most powerful deck. She's a 3-3 human artificer that costs 2 blue red. And she has, whenever you cast a Sorx spell, draw a card. Now, artifacts, legendaries, and sagas are historic, but the thing that we're going to focus on is artifacts. Artifacts can be extremely cheap both in budget and in mana cost. The more artifacts that we cast, the more cards that we draw, and we can cast more artifacts and draw more cards. You see the point. This deck can be incredibly hard to stop, and when it is stopped, it can recover at an absurd speed. Now, the reason that I won't play this deck except on rare occasions is because it's so powerful and because it can become a game of solitaire very quickly. With the perfect hand and setup, this deck can win as early as turn 2. And the turn that it does win is gonna take a while. So you're going to be running an absurd amount of mana rocks in this deck, like Is It Signet, that are extremely mana efficient. The mana rocks not only ramp you, but they're also going to cantrip when you cast them. More importantly than mana rocks, though, we're also going to be running mana reducers like Semblance Anvil. It has imprint when it enters the battlefield, you can exile a non-land card from your hand, and then spells you cast that share a card type with the exiled card cost two less to cast. So by exiling one artifact from our hand, all of our artifacts cost two less. And the vast majority of artifacts cost two or less mana. So now we can essentially cast our artifacts for free and just keep drawing through our deck, casting more artifacts for free, and you get the point. And of course, we're also going to be playing artifacts that draw us even more cards like Prophetic Prism. So on top of the card draw that we get from our commander, now we get to dig even deeper with these kinds of cards. We've also got cards like Conjurer's Bobble that cost less we can sacrifice to draw. And on top of Joyra's trigger, we're also going to have other triggers to help us out too, like Artificer's Assistant. It says whenever you cast a Sorc spell, scry one. So now when we cast an artifact, we get to scry one first, and then we get to draw. So instead of drawing into a dead card like a land, we can just draw into more artifacts. And the biggest way to do this comes with a card like Mana Severance. It essentially lets us search our library for all of our lands and then exile them. So now we're just going to be drawing into more and more gas and we're pretty much never going to stall. To make our turn even longer, we're going to return all of our artifacts back to our hand with something like Paradoxical Outcome. And for each artifact that we bring back to our hand with this, we draw another card. Thanks to our mana reducers, we can then cast those cards again for free and then draw even more cards. When it's time to finish our opponents off, we can do it with something like Aetherflux Reservoir or Temporal Fissure. Reservoir says, whenever you cast a spell, you gain 1 life for each spell that you've cast this turn, and then pay 50 life, Aetherflux Reservoir deals 50 damage to our creature or player. With the amount of spells that we cast in a turn, it's going to be easier for us to ping down each of our opponents. And Temporal Fisher says, return target permanent to its owner's hand, and it's got Storm. So again, for each spell that we cast that turn, we can bounce something. And that includes our opponent's lands, so goodbye. Again, this deck is not one that I play with very often, except in very rare circumstances where we're playing at a very high level. And I always make sure to ask players ahead of time if they're going to be okay with it because of the type of deck it is. Anyways, let's move on to my next most powerful deck with Golos Tireless Pilgrim. And if you haven't seen my Close Quarters gameplay episode yet, make sure you check that out to see this deck in action. Anyways, Golos is a 3-5 scout that costs 5, and when it enters the battlefield, you can search your library for a land and put that card onto the battlefield, tap, and then shuffle your library. By paying 2 in Wooburg, you exile the top 3 cards of your library, you may play them this turn without paying their mana cost. So Golos not only ramps you and helps fix your mana, but it also lets you cast things off the top for free. And casting 3 things off the top for free can generate you an absurd amount of value. So the basic goal of this deck is to ramp, get Golos out, control the board, and then cast incredibly powerful spells. Ramping early and often is important, so we're going to be running cards like Ramp and Growth. Again, the quicker that we can ramp, the faster we get Golos out, and then the quicker we can get things going. Once we activate Golos the first time, we're going to be hoping to set our opponents back with something like Ingaric's Wake or Tragic Arrogance. Ingaric's Wake is going to destroy all creatures and planeswalkers we don't control. And then Tragic Arrogance says, for each player, you choose from among the permanents that player controls an artifact, a creature, an enchantment, and a planeswalker, then each player sacrifices all their non permanents they control. Essentially, we want to run very powerful rasps, but ones that do not blow up Golos. 
because the longer that Golos stays on the field, the more value we get out of it. We're also hoping to hit cards off the top that can extend our turn. Early Harvest is going to untap all basic lands that we control, and we're running a ton of basic lands. And with all that mana that we're going to be untapping, we can activate Golos at least one more time. And then Brass's Bounty is going to give us a treasure for each land that we control. This can really help us out when it comes to mana fixing and activating Golos multiple times. And of course, an extra turn spell like Karns and Portal Sundering can come in really handy as well. And then we've also got plenty of cards that can help us cast things for free, so yeah, just an absurd amount of value that we can hit off the top. But for this deck to finish out the game, we're going to be using Doomsday. It says, search your library and graveyard for five cards and exile the rest, but the chosen cards on top of your library in any order, you lose half your life rounded up. Golos casts cards for free off the top of our library, so if we get the right cards on top in the right order, we can just win from there. We've got a lot of combinations of cards that we can get with Doomsday to win, but essentially all of them do the exact same thing. Essentially, the goal is to cast one spell over and over again. In this case, let's talk about Treacherous Terrain. It's going to deal damage to each opponent equal to the number of lands that that player controls. So as long as each of our opponents has one land, we can cast this card an infinite amount of times to deal infinite damage to them. If you want to see that combo, go ahead and check out that deck tech, but essentially we use cards like Reclaim to get this card back on top, and then so on and so forth. Again, this deck can be incredibly powerful and can take some pretty long turns, but nowhere near as long as Joyra. That being said, this is one of the decks that I do have a stack of cards on the side that I switch out in between games depending on who I'm playing with. If I need to tone the deck down, I definitely can. So instead of an incredibly synergistic deck, I might just be casting big things off the top for fun. Speaking of fun, let's move on to my next most powerful deck with Ink Treader Nephilim. Ink Treader Nephilim is a 3-3 Nephilim that costs red, green, white, blue. It has whenever a player casts an instant sorcery spell, if that spell targets only Ink Treader Nephilim, copy that spell for each other creature that that spell could target. Each copy targets a different one of those creatures. Now you might notice one thing slightly off about this commander, in that it's not actually a legal commander. Although the Nephilim definitely should be legendary, lore-wise, wizards, they are not. Regardless, I like to say that Commander is a social game, so just talk. I wanted Ink Trader Nephilim to be my commander for a deck, so I talked with my playgroup and they were completely fine with it. So I built it, and I gotta say, I love this deck. It's a lot like Zada, but on a completely different level. Unlike Zada, it gives you access to four colors instead of one, and it also counts your opponent's creatures. So essentially, every single time a spell gets cast, it multiplies. If there are 10 creatures on the board, you're getting 10 iterations of that spell. So with this commander, you can do incredibly powerful things with extremely budget cards. At the time I built this deck, I did it for only $35, and yes, I still consider this my third most powerful deck, even with that budget restriction. If I would have added that extra $15 with the $50 budgets that I normally do, that would have bumped it up even further, potentially. It may have even unseated Golos at number two. Regardless, let's talk about those cards, starting with cantrips like Expedite. Expedite's going to give target creature haste until end of turn, and it's going to draw us a card. So essentially for a red mana, we draw a card for each creature on the board. Again, with 10 creatures on the board, that's 10 cards for one mana. And on top of that, it's going to give all of our creatures haste, which can come in handy. But yeah, the important part again is drawing 10 cards for one mana, and it can draw even more than that when set up correctly. So even less efficient cantrips like Thermal Flux can be great in this deck as well. It says choose one, target non-snow permanent becomes snow until end of turn, or target snow permanent isn't snow until end of turn, draw a card at the beginning of the next turn's upkeep. So that snow part really does absolutely nothing. And even though we can't draw those cards until our next turn's upkeep, one mana to draw 10 cards on a delay is still fantastic. And we're also going to want some protection spells too, like Sheltering Light. It says target creature gains indestructible until end of turn, scry one. Scrying one 10 times is great, but protecting the board is even better. And this not only protects our creatures, but it also protects our opponent's creatures too, which is actually huge for this deck. It might be counterintuitive, but if someone tries to rant the board, we want to protect everyone's creatures, not just our own. Because again, the more creatures that are in play, the more that we benefit from all of our spells. And of course, we've got some ways to put even more creatures on the board, like Spawning Breath. It's going to deal 1 damage to our creature or player when we make a 0-1 Eldrazi spawn. So for each creature on the board, we ping it for 1 and we make an Eldrazi spawn. This essentially doubles up the number of creatures on the board, not counting the ones that die from that ping. With all those cards that we're going to be drawing, we can use something like Iula's Influence to make even more tokens. It says discard a land card, create a 2-2 green bear creature token. When we're drawing 10 cards at a time, we can easily discard a couple of land cards, make more tokens, draw even more cards, and so on and so forth. And perhaps the best of these is Silver for Partisan, which says whenever a wolf or werewolf you control becomes the target of an insert sorcery spell, put a 2-2 green wolf creature token onto the battlefield. So the more wolves that get targeted, the more that we make, and the more that get targeted, you see where this is going. Anyways, we can easily finish our opponents off with our army of tokens, but we've got other ways to help as well. Fist of Flame helps out in multiple ways. It says, draw a card until end of turn, target creature gains trample and gets plus one plus zero for each card you've drawn this turn. With the amount of cards that we can draw in a turn, we can turn even these smallest creatures into a deadly force. And of course, we can turn any threat and effect into an insurrection, like Carry Zev's Expertise. It says, gain control of target creature or vehicle until end of turn, untap it against haste until end of turn, and you may cast a card with converted mana cost two or less from your hand without paying its mana cost. 
So this is going to gain us control of every single creature on the board, and on top of that, it lets us cast a card for free from our hand for each of those creatures. The vast majority of cards in this deck have a converted mana cost of two or less, so we can pretty much cast whatever we want. And of course, we can easily take our opponents out with something like Psychosis Crawler. It says whenever you draw a card, each opponent loses one life. So just casting a couple of cantrips in one turn can easily take everyone out. Calling this deck explosive is a bit of an understatement. It can really utilize budget cards in some incredibly powerful ways and can go off very quickly. And the final deck that I'm going to talk about today is my fourth most powerful deck that I own with Kenrith Return King. I actually played this deck on an Extra Turns episode with the Command Zone, so if you haven't seen that yet, go ahead and check it out. Kenneth is a 5-5 human noble that costs 4 and a white, and he does a lot of things, so here we go. Red, all creatures gain trample and haste until end of turn. 1 in a green, put a plus plus 1 counter on target creature. 2 in a white, target player gains 5 life. 3 in a blue, target player draws a card. 4 in a black, put target creature card from a graveyard onto the battlefield under its owner's control. So Kenrith is a Swiss army knife that does a lot of things. I built a political control deck around him to utilize all of his abilities. So you definitely can help other players out to gain political favor, but at a certain point, you can easily take over the game. To best utilize Kenrith's abilities, though, you want some ways to really take advantage of them. So cards like Wilderness Reclamation, Heartstone, and Biomits are familiar can come in huge. Wilderness Reclamation says at the beginning of your end step, untap all lands you control. The more activations that we get from Kenrith's ability, the better. And then Hearthstone says, Activate abilities of creatures cost one less to activate. This effect can reduce mana in the cost of less than one mana. Biomancer's Familiar is similar, but it only reduces the cost of our own creatures' activate abilities, and they cost two less instead of one. So these really help us utilize Kenrith's abilities by abusing them even more. Because Kenrith can bring creatures back, we're going to be running cards like Merciless Executioner, Spore Frog, and Dauntless Escort. When Merciless Executioner enters the battlefield, each player sacrifices a creature. So this is essentially a repeatable edict effect that we can keep getting back with Kenrith. And then Spore Frog says, Sacrifice Spore Frog, prevent all combat damage to be dealt this turn. And a repeatable fog is fantastic for this deck. And so is repeatable board wipe protection like Dauntless Escort. It says, Sacrifice Dauntless Escort, creatures you control gain indestructible until end of turn. So we can keep bringing this back to protect our board again and again. To finish our opponents off, we're going to be running cards like Molten Primordial, Will Breaker, and Tainted Remedy. When Molten Primordial enters the battlefield for each opponent, gain control of up to one target creature that player controls until end of turn, untap those creatures that gain haste until end of turn. So if we've got a way to sacrifice this, we can keep threatening our opponent's creatures. Willbreaker takes things a step further. It says, whenever a creature an opponent controls becomes a target of a spell or ability you control, gain control of that creature for as long as you control Willbreaker. So Kenris plus one counter ability comes in huge with this. Without any reduction, it's basically pay one in a green, gain control of target creature. And then Tainted Remedy says if an opponent would gain life, that player loses that much life instead. So now when we make target player gain five life, they're going to be losing it. Essentially, to win, we turn Kenris' abilities from helpful to hurtful. It's a deck that's a ton of fun and can do some really powerful things. And with that, this show is coming to a close, so it's my turn here from you. So in the comments below, let me know what your most powerful deck is and why. So yeah, let me know in the comments below. And as always, thanks again and have a good one.